Hello and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Julie Lafford, Executive Director for Alumni Engagement at York University. Thanks for joining us today. This webinar is part of our Scholars Hub at Home speaker series, which features educational lectures by academics from York. We're pleased to be able to bring this series online to allow even more alumni and friends to hear from some of the university's leading scholars. As this event is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you're currently on. We ask if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takuranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Before we begin today's lecture, I'd like to share some exciting news with you. For the last 20 years, the Bryden Alumni Awards have celebrated alumni who've changed the world for the better. The tradition of recognizing their contributions will continue virtually at the York U Alumni Celebration honoring 20 years of Bryden Awards. This will be a virtual event which will take place on November 19th from 7 to 8 p.m. And the event will bring together 20 years of award winners with York's global community of alumni, friends, students, and York leaders for an entertaining and inspiring evening featuring many of York's uh, alumni luminaries. We're thrilled to be able to offer complimentary tickets for this event, and I hope you can attend. You can RSVP today at alumniandfriends.yorku.ca slash Bryden. And to stay in the know with the university stories and updates, make sure you're receiving our monthly e-newsletter, Alumni Matters. The November issue will be arriving in inboxes shortly, and it's chock full of alumni-specific content, university updates, other virtual events for you to attend, and much more. And if you're not receiving Alumni Matters for some reason and you'd like to, please contact us at alumni at yorku.ca. As those of you who have joined us for previous events will already know, we always like to get our know, to know our audience a little bit at the beginning of these events. So there'll be a poll appearing on your screen soon asking what area of the world are you tuning in from? So it'll pop up on your screen now and I'll just give you a moment to respond. Thanks everyone who's responded in that poll. It's helpful for our speakers to have an idea about who's in the audience. And I see that 91% are from, from, from Canada, welcome. And uh, our friends in the United States, welcome to this very relevant topic today. Uh, if, if you need help with the Zoom webinar at any point, feel free to click on that Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and enter your question and our team's ready to help you. The same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speakers to answer during the Q&A period following the lecture. For those of you watching on Facebook, feel free to submit any questions there and the team will send them my way. So today's talk is titled, Claim the Vote, Claim the Country, on the question of 2020 US elections and the commons. And it's featuring Dr. Anna Agathangelou and Adam Churchard, who's a PhD candidate at York. Dr. Anna Agathangelou is a professor in the Department of Politics at York and is Adam's PhD supervisor. Anna teaches in the areas of international relations as well as women in politics. Some of her areas of expertise are time and temporality in global politics, the body, time and ecology, international feminist political economy, and feminist post-colonial and decolonial thought. Adam Churchard, as I said, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Politics. His research focuses on international relations, US electoral politics, and growing concerns over election security in the US and around the world. Welcome, Adam and Anna. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. I'm very much looking forward to this lecture. Uh, it couldn't be more timely, and um, it's going to be an interesting one. So welcome, and I'll turn the floor over to you.
Uh, well, thank you so much for, uh, for having us here today. Uh, just as a, a quick note, uh, I'm going to speak for a, a few minutes, uh, and then uh, Anna will speak for a few minutes, and then we will uh, uh, go and, uh, and, and go into Q&A. Um, so just to start off, um, I, I, I want to first give a few thoughts on what happened last night, um, and then get into a bit more detail into this issue of voter fraud and voter suppression that, that has become such a prominent issue uh, in this campaign. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, to start off, this is the, the chaos scenario that I think so many people were afraid of. We're down to, uh, you know, razor thin margins in a few states deciding the presidency and a president who is claiming premature victory. Uh, this is not where I think uh, uh, most people who, uh, uh, are in favor of democracy want to be. Um, and there's still a lot to, to find out. The votes are still being counted. Um, there's, there's still a lot uh, to, to unpack. But I think one thing that is clear right now is that this election was not the massive repudiation of Donald Trump that many people hoped it would be. Uh, the polls were quite off. Um, Donald Trump actually outperformed his previous um, uh, performance in, in many states, including key swing states like Florida. Uh, he's going to lose the popular vote by not by nearly as high a margin as, as the poll suggested that he would. Um, as well, um, the Senate looks likely to stay Republican. Uh, so, you know, if Biden, you know, ekes out a win here, which balance of probabilities, it looks like he will, but it's still very unclear. If he gets in, he is going to be dealing with a Republican Senate that is going to block his every move. Um, it's also one, one thing that, that still needs a lot of unpacking, but um, uh, is, is, is jumping out is, is this election has kind of blown a bit of a hole in this widely held belief, both by Republicans and by Democrats, that higher turnout generally favors Republicans, or sorry, Democrats. Um, there's, there's a few caveats to that. Biden did win the popular vote. Um, and second, you know, the, the impacts of voter suppression efforts, we're never really going to know the, the full picture of, of what that did to distort the vote. You know, all of the mail-in ballots that did not arrive by election day. I think we just saw 15% of mail-in ballots uh, in South Florida did not make it for election day and will never be counted. Um, we saw things like uh, in Harris County, Houston, where uh, a last minute frivolous Republican lawsuit uh, to throw out 120,000 already cast ballots. Uh, you know, it was a lawsuit that uh, was frivolous from the get-go. It was thrown out by an all-Republican Supreme, state Supreme Court. It was thrown out by a highly partisan Republican judge. Um, but it had the effect of, um, you know, Harris County panicking and closing nine of their 10 polling, uh, drive-in polling stations on the eve of the election. Who knows what, what effect that really had. Um, but at the end of the day, we did see what's looking like, you know, record high turnout, uh, the likes of which have not been seen in a century, and it did not swing decisively for Biden, like I think a lot of people uh, hope, were hoping and, and thought that it would. Um, so yes, uh, the, the big takeaway that I have right now is that this was not a decisive repudiation of Trump. I think that's very disappointing for a variety of reasons, too many to, to talk about now. Um, but the one that I want to talk about and the one that uh, I'm going to use to kind of segue into the next part of my talk is that um, I, I, Donald Trump and the Republican Party, for all intents and purposes, have declared a war on democracy in the United States. Um, you know, this, this, this cycle, we, we've seen an assault on democratic principles that I, I, I think is, is quite remarkable. Um, and it's, it's kind of all been based around this issue of, of voter fraud. Uh, so to, to give a bit of background context, um, you know, since the 1960s, um, with the civil rights uh, movement and with um, the passing of the Voting Rights Act, uh, the Republican Party has used this specter of uh, voter fraud, this idea that illegally, many illegally cast ballots uh, are being cast to throw elections to Democrats um is 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 you know this this existential threat to uh, american democracy now to be clear these claims have really no basis in fact um you know republicans have been trying for decades um with much concerted effort to try and prove these claims and they just have not panned out they're just not based in fact 
Um, but over the years, and particularly over the last 20 years, um, we've seen it have an effect of chipping away at confidence in uh, American elections. We've seen it uh, vilifying marginalized voters, particularly black voters, particularly poor voters, uh, vilifying them and basically saying that, you know, if they can't get through all these hurdles to vote, they don't deserve to vote. Um, uh, and we've seen it um, uh, result in Republican state legislatures passing a, in the last 20 years, a slew of um, legislation to make voting harder by making, uh, you know, voter registration harder, by making uh, the types of IDs you can use to vote more restrictive, by curbing uh, the number of days you can do early voting, that sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, this whole voter fraud issue uh, is, is nothing new to the Republican Party. And they've, 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 they've been setting the stage um, for this for a long time. And, you know, these claims of voter fraud have been central to Trump's politics as well since he entered the presidential scene. Um, you know, we, we remember uh, Donald Trump claiming repeatedly during his campaign against Hillary Clinton that Democrats would steal the election by voter fraud, uh, specifically committed by undocumented migrants. Uh, he claimed after the election, you know, when he won the electoral college vote, um, but lost the popular vote, that he would have won the popular vote if it weren't for millions of illegally cast ballots. Again, just a completely baseless claim. He even set up a presidential advisory commission on election integrity to try and prove these claims that he was making, and they couldn't do it, and it was disbanded. Um, so Donald Trump is no stranger to baseless voter fraud claims as well. Um, but during this election, um, I, I, I think that he, he, he ramped it up to uh, an even more disturbing level. Um, in the middle of the worst pandemic in a century, you know, which the U.S. has been particularly hard by, he took special aim at the unprecedented number of mail-in ballots that were being cast. So we saw him claim, uh, despite the fact that many voters, including Trump himself, had used mail-in voting in previous elections, despite the fact that it is used in many local and state elections with no problems, that these mail-in ballots would lead to massive fraud and would steal the election for Biden. Uh, and then we saw him, you know, in the final closing days of the campaign that say, start to say that, you know, the, the ballots have to all be counted by November 3rd. Uh, and any ballots counted after November 3rd are, are illegitimate and fraudulent, which I, it's, it's just such an absurd claim. I, I don't really know where to begin. <laughs> um, and, and again, all of this without evidence. And we saw him really not <laughs> make it decisively make it decisively clear that, that he would leave office if he lost um, the election. Um, so he, it's, it's, it's really set a very dangerous stage and, and we saw him continue to make these claims last night and this morning. And the, the point that I really want to hammer home here um, uh, to, to close off my speech is that you know, we can't just see this as just speech and just the president as, as important as, as the speech itself is and the president is you know, we, we really need to uh, understand that, you know, that this chaos that we're finding ourselves in now is the result of a coordinated Republican attack on democracy at multiple levels of government. Um, and just to kind of go through it now, it's, it's basically happened how I see it in, in four key ways. So one, we've seen President Trump and his proxies making these claims that mail-in votes are fraudulent, that elections must be decided on election night and any votes counted afterwards are fraudulent. Uh, second, they installed uh, Louis DeJoy as Postmaster General, who basically, you know, served to make massive cuts to mail service over the summer, uh, particularly in battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, creating massive confusion and doubt as to how to vote. <coughs> Third, we saw Republican state legislatures, specifically Republican controlled state legislatures in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin refused to allow pre-processing of early ballots and refused to extend the deadline to mail in, for mail-in ballots to, to make up for what was going on uh, at, the, uh, at the Postal Service. So they ensured that those states wouldn't be called early. They um, ensured that um, the mail-in ballots would not be counted until very late to show Donald Trump up on election night. And possibly they're gonna throw out many of these mail-in ballots. Um, so remember, when you see President Trump today complaining about how long it's taking in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin uh, to count the ballots, remember, it's taking so long because Republican state legislatures refused to allow pre-processing of early ballots like they do in Florida, like they do in Arizona, like they do in North Carolina, and on and on. 
Um, so so they, they set the stage for this. And then for, um, you've seen at the court level um, over the last several months, the advancement of this legal theory that state legislatures have supreme authority over election administration um, and that the executive branches of the states and the state courts really don't have much authority um, over elections and over um, the constitutional interpretation. You know, that's what we're seeing playing out in Pennsylvania, uh, where the uh, Supreme, state Supreme Court um, decided based on their interpretation of the, um, uh, of the state constitution that the mail-in ballot uh, deadline had to be extended for another three days. Um, um, uh, you saw Republicans uh, fight that ruling in the Supreme Court, and while they weren't successful, um, uh, the decision was made without uh, Justice Barrett, uh, who was newly installed, and it was also made with um, uh, with some justices commenting that the only reason they didn't find in favor of the Republicans is because it was so close to the election. And you saw Brett Kavanaugh's opinion in that case, again, advancing this legal theory that it's the legislatures, not any other, the state legislatures, not any other body that decides um, uh, how elections are run. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're at the, and, and, and now we're at the situation where we could see this, uh, this case revived at the Supreme Court with Justice Barrett on the bench. And we're basically at the point where, you know, these, these ballots that can now possibly decide the presidency still arriving, um, their fate will now, could now be determined by uh, a Supreme Court with Justice Barrett, who could throw out all these ballots. Um, so the, the, the two final closing thoughts I guess I have are that, one, I, I really hope this doesn't come down to Pennsylvania. And two, I am, I mean, I, I've always been concerned about the state of democracy in the United States, but never more so than now. Okay. Um, thanks uh, to all of you and thanks for organizing. Um, what I will do, thanks Adam as well for your presentation because this um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, allows me to move into a couple of things that I wanted to say. So I will begin with uh, what Adam said about uh, the question of democracy and for my situation I will say that um, what we are seeing right now is the contestation between a semblance of liberal democracy and what uh, um, Jimmy Carter uh, said, an, olig an oligarchy with unlimited political bribery. So basically that's what we are seeing. And of course, you know, I mean, um, uh, Donald Trump, I mean, already at like 420, he blasted an email um, saying, I will read this to you because I thought it was very interesting. He says, the Democrats will try to steal, and he wrote steal with capital le letters, the election, exclamation mark. President Trump needs you to step up and defend the results. And he sent this email everywhere simultaneously. Um, he's asking people for money uh, contributions, basically, in order to make sure that they, you know, they uh, win the election. The same thing happens with with uh, Vice President Mike Pence, who is also making solicitations. And it's really important for people to understand that Mike, Tense was, uh, Mike Pence, uh, when he was uh, you know, a governor of Indiana, played a huge role in the ID uh, uh, introduction of ID technologies uh, to control and basically subvert the vote. So I think here, I, what I want us to understand is also that there is a kind of a continuation in terms of um, uh, political leadership, but also how they circulate in different um, positions um, to ensure and secure uh, their political power. So as Adam said, I mean, I can share something with you, the screen where we are today in terms of like the, uh, you know, the numbers. Um, here you can see uh, Biden with 238 and then, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump with 213. Here, as uh, Adam already said, I mean, you know, the Democrats thought that they would be able to really, you know, at least get um, a 50 percent in terms of the Senate. You know, they will increase their numbers in, in terms of the House, but it doesn't look that's the case. And I think this is really significant in, in a sense that it raises questions. How come? 
And of course, you know, I mean, a lot of people have put that on the pause, you know, they, you know, all the polling that is happening and they are raising questions. I mean, the polls are saying one story, but then when we go to the polls, we find a very different story emerging. And as, as Adam said, I mean, everybody was thinking that Americans will vote out Donald Trump, but that's not the case. So then the question for us is how come? You know, how come it, uh, Trump is as powerful or, you know, as powerful as if, uh, the last, I mean, the four, four years ago? And in some ways, um, his presidency, even after all the scandals, is still, you know, um, I mean, um, as strong as it was like, I mean, I mean, four years ago, especially with COVID-19 as well and the way he has handled COVID-19. So here, I mean, you know, uh, what I will say here, there is a kind of um, important thing for us to think about is that, um, um, and we don't want to think about it, but we have seen it, slavery as an institution informed and shaped the, you know, the way that the United States is organized, both constitutionally, but also in terms of like, you know, the voting um, uh, approach to democracy. And then of course, from the beginning there, I mean, one of the important issues that we have to realize is what is called the three-fifths compromise which was a compromise reached among state delegates during the 1787 United States Constitutional Convention. The delegates disputed whether and how slaves will be counted when determining a state's total population, as this number would determine a state's number of seats in the House of Representatives, and how much it would pay in taxes. The compromise counted three out of every five slaves as people, giving the southern states a third, uh, a third more seats in Congress and a third more electoral votes than if, uh, than if slaves had been ignored, but fewer than if slaves uh, if slaves and free people had been counted equally. The compromise was proposed by delegate James Wilson and seconded by Charles uh, Pigney. Why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because in a lot of ways, what Adam was saying before, a lot of the conversation around the uh, border suppression has been really displaced on black populations. And, and of course, you know, a, a lot of that, you know, um, uh, there have been a series of um, what I will call uh, attempts and practices implemented both legally, you know, but also illegally in order to make sure that uh, certain votes that uh, do not vote in particular people, they are kicked out. So, and, and here what is important, again, I mean, I don't want to draw a very linear line from slavery to today, but I want to um, um, point to us that there is a kind of a relationship that is ongoing, even though it is placed in different ways. So um, here I will move with the Reagan administration uh, with the Iran-Contra affair when he was critiqued. Um, uh, the Republican Party decided that they didn't, they wanted to figure out uh, creative ways of basically uh, uh, kicking out anybody who disagreed with them. So this is an important issue. And how did that happen? It happened with diff uh, three, what I would call three mechanisms. The one was what Adam already said, the suppression of the vote with provisional ballots which also uh, allows us to uh, connect and understand how the polls are not accurate. So people, uh, the, the, what we call the Help America Vote Act of 2000, provided a partial answer to the shift of the American, um, uh, American Republican ship. The Harvard law was passed on a bipartisan basis after the hanging Chad disaster in Florida in the 2000s around a Gore election, and which was the main excuse given to the media for that state's substantial Republican ship. But the giant loophole it created for GOP vote suppressors was that provision of ballots are almost never counted. People are supposed to be told, however, people are never um, informed that their votes are not counted. So a lot of these voters come out voting, let's say, democratic, but they come out and they say that to the pollsters, but in reality, their votes are not counted. So the polls, in a way, when they are counting this, they don't have an accurate account of, you know, who is voting democratic or republican. So 
that's one thing that I, I wanted to bring to our attention. The second thing, of course, is diluting the vote with gerrymandering. Um, this is the redesign of congressional districts and which also, in a way, this is informed and shaped by money and politics. And it's also uh, pushing out certain people not to vote um, in, a way, in a way that um, uh, Adam and I, I mean, I am, and myself are thinking that if we're thinking about wanting more people to participate in a democracy and have an impact and claim their vote and thereby claim the public decisions that are made about them, you know, and without them, and then uh, gerrymandering kicks them out. So in that sense, um, less and less people are having the ability to vote in, uh, you know, uh, vote out people that are, you know, are not really taking decisions that are going to benefit a larger population within the United States. And the third thing, of course, which is absolutely crucial for us, and, and that's why I connected it with the slavery question, is depressing the vote with money and politics. And I'm only just going to read you a couple of things that I think are really crucial. How billionaire oligarch uh, Rupert Murdoch, and I think this is really important for us to think that, uh, in a way that, that um, claiming your vote or voting uh, as an institution is not separated from other institutions, including, as already um, uh, uh, Adam suggested, uh, the Supreme Court. And we saw that the uh, vine of um, of the power of the Supreme Court by the Republicans is significant, not only in terms of uh, what decisions are being made, but what decisions are um, made, especially around elections and who is going to be leading uh, the United States. So a billionaire oligarch, Robert Merchant programs his own, uh, his very own television news network to promote the interest of the billionaire class uh, with such effectiveness that average working people themselves are repeating billionaire helpful uh, memes like cut regulations, shrink government, cut taxes. And of course, what we also heard in this particular election was that Biden was a socialist. Uh, Biden is far from a socialist. Biden, Biden is, you know, if we're gonna think more from a critical perspective, he's going to really want the United States to continue to be a superpower and to be an imperial power in the world. So he's very far from a socialist candidate. But a lot of people started really um, circulating this discourse about Biden, which is very problematic as well, especially you know, when we're thinking about literacy in the United States. And I want to say something to that because it's significant also for us to think about that in Canada. Uh, that will cause more working people and their children to get sick and or die, and we saw that happening with COVID-19, will transfer more money and power from the public or, you know, let's say working class people, or poor people, you know, um, uh, marginalized populations to a few oligarchs and will lower working class wages over time. Um, a small group of billionaires also have funneled so much money into a, uh, to the political sphere that normal, normal, and I put in quotes here, Republicans like former U.S. Senators Jeff Flake and Bob Corker point out that they couldn't get elected in today's environment because they would face primary challenges funded by right wing uh, billionaires. Um, the corporate media itself, and I am emphasizing the corporate media because the corporate media is not just what you watch on TV. It's also, uh, you know, uh, companies, you know, that are circulating a lot of like um, a material on the internet. A lot of the youth is being impacted by that as well. And um, uh, this media heavily influenced by the roughly one billion that the Koch networks, the Koch network is very significant in changing dramatically um, you know, how the United States um, uh, elections will be impacted. Uh, Sheldon Adelson, the Mercers, et cetera, poured through their advertising coffers and into their profits in the last presidential election. What did even mention in their news reporting that billionaire oligarchs are mainly calling the tunes in American politics, particularly in the GOP. And uh, I mean, there is more here that I can tell you, but uh, for the sake of time, I want to say how significant this is 
in the sense that it also impacts um, the way like global powers themselves are participating in impacting the role, uh, I mean, the elections in the United States, but not just the United States. So here, I think um, uh, I want to shift a little bit to uh, move to the question, how might the election, uh, depending who ends up being, uh, uh, you know, the leader, impact, uh, you know, international relations or, glo I mean, or um, global relations. Um, a new administration would uh, reassess all foreign policy, including the U.S.-Russian relations, but a Biden win is unlikely to result in a significant change vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia. Uh, Russia has been reassessing its kind of connections with Trump, especially around whether Trump is going to support the Russian interest in the global context. Of course, you may be asking, what are the Russian interests? Of course, Russia wants to be left alone and wants to be taken um, uh, equally seriously. That is, a, uh, that continues to be a superpower in global politics. Um, what is, um, I mean, if Trump remains in power, what is Putin likely to try to get from him? Uh, the question is, what does he, uh, Putin want, of course? He wants Russia to be treated as one of the great powers in the world, alongside the US and China. He's unlikely to get that from any American president. He wants his economy to grow, but US-Russian trade ties have never been particularly impressive. Putin may be counting on Trump to help him achieve other goals, like reducing US troops in Germany and undermining NATO, but the Russians see these decisions as evidence of Trump's petulant incompetence rather than as rapprochement. I mean, uh, Putin does not see uh, Trump as a serious leader or, you know, but he sees him as somebody that he can use in order to secure his own interest. Um, how am I doing with time? Um, so they, uh, in terms of the relations with China around trade and the economy, I, I suspect the consensus is partially right. Direct trade and market access pressure on China will largely continue. However, indirect and more coordinated investment related and military pressure may increase. And few important but narrowly defined areas of cooperation will be pursued with vigor. Taken together, this combination of status quo and change will result in a Biden administration that may find, if Biden wins, of course, that may find itself pursuing policies that contrast sharply with one another. U.S. military actions in the Asian region may prove more unilateral, while economic actions may prove to be an interesting mix of renewed but limited multilateralism and continued protectionism. Importantly, these China policies may be promulgated earlier in the administration than many think if Biden wins. Uh, what is important that I wanted to bring up uh, about Biden, many of you probably have su uh, are suspecting this, is that um, uh, Biden will really um, uh, maintain the majority of existing economic tariffs on Chinese goods. However, he will probably lift a narrow range of targeted tariffs on certain intermediate and lower value added products with limited alternative sources. The other important issue I think with uh, Biden, if Biden wins, it will be the question about uh, a better position to work more closely uh, with European and Asian allies to further tighten government screening of Chinese investment by state-owned enterprises in sensitive high-tech and dual-use um, uh, sectors. I think this is really also important in terms of the Canadian uh, connection. And also Biden will, um, you know, uh, want to make sure that China um, you know, plays a role in the climate change uh, deliberations. Of course, um, you know, that will be putting pressure on China to do so. Um, you know, the, with uh, the European context, of course, uh, Biden is going to change those relationships or, I mean, change them. Uh, it will play a role in uh, making them a bit more, um, um, you know, creating trust and co uh, cohesion in the transatlantic relationship. A critical reset is needed after four years of a Trump administration that has called the European Union a four, raised out of an American's commitment to the, uh, they, uh, NATO, and has withdrawn from key international treaties such as the Paris Climate Accord and the Iran nuclear deal. In the Middle East, I don't think there is going to be a lot of change if Biden won. And then, um, uh, okay, um, 
and I will I will leave it here in the sense and um, you know just uh, say one last thing because uh, we're question and answers that ultimately who wins here is going back to what I said before is a contestation between the attempt to go more towards a more public democracy versus uh, you know an oligarchy with uh, uh, with corruption. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both so much, Anna and Adam. Um, there is so much to unpack. Um, it is time for Q&A, so I'll invite the audience to go ahead and submit any questions that you have through that Q&A button. I already have a couple of um, interesting ones, and I'm going to start with um, one that is, is all about the math. So uh, we have an anonymous attendee who asks, in the event of a tie, so 269 electoral college votes go to Biden and 269 go to Donald Trump. The constitution allows for the House of Representatives to elect the next president and the Senate to elect the next vice president. And if they can't agree by inauguration day in January 2021, the vice president can step into the shoes of the president. And the next president will be Kamala Harris. Any thoughts on that? Adam, do you want to take it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I, I don't think that that is what is going to happen. Um, just, and I, just because I, 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 I think that, um, you know, regardless of what the institutional rules say, um, I, I, I think we've seen, um, uh, you know, especially over the last four years, um, the institutional rules are played pretty fast and loose uh, in U.S. politics these days. And I don't think that uh, in the case of a 269-269 victory, um, uh, it, it would come down to following the rules and installing Kamala Harris as president. Uh, I, I, I don't think that the Republicans uh, and Donald Trump specifically would, would, would accept it. And I, I think that, um, we would, we would lead to complete political chaos before we ever got to the point of, of putting Kamala Harris as the vice president. Uh, I mean, I would agree with uh, Adam, you know, that I do think this is not, I mean, it would be great. And I think this is like, an, um, a kind of a positive approach to thinking about what could happen and we would love to see that happening but i don't see that trump is going to allow that from taking place and i i do really feel that trump um knows including and we have seen also like i mean with the elections of the you know the um, uh, the senate the leader i mean the republican senate leader Already, we are seeing that um, you know the Republicans know there is enough substantive, uh, you know, uh, support and power that they are going to wield in order to sustain what I said in the beginning, the oligarchy. And uh, I think, in that sense, um, it's going to be uh, the Supreme Court is going to play a huge role in determining how the elections are going to. Uh, I mean, what the results are going to mean. Yeah, which is also, of course, as you know, already the ground was prepared for the, uh, you know, uh, Supreme Court to be playing that role. So, so that's, um, unfortunately, I think that's the route that they are going to take. And let's hope that it doesn't go to that, that it's not 269, that is going to be more, you know, the Biden, maybe it will be the Pennsylvania question, you know, yeah. Thanks for your response to that. So the next question comes from Rolando. And um, the question is, this election has garnered a huge voter turnout for what's normally expected of the United States. And do you think that this momentum can lead to significant and lasting change that will alleviate voter suppression? Um, I, I can take this question. Um, 
I think the, the one thing that is interesting about this, and this is a great question, by the way, because, and we don't know yet, we have to assess, because it's very interesting in the sense that we saw a lot of Democratic uh, voters uh, mailing in their votes, but then the day of the election, which was very interesting too, which also has a lot to do with the, the dominant narratives and discourses that were circulating around COVID-19, a lot of the people that went to the polls were Republicans, or at least the voting numbers pointed to that, which I thought personally was very interesting, this kind of a division. Um, and partially because a lot of Democrats did not want to go and stand in lines and around COVID-19, but a lot of Republicans ended up doing that even with this pandemic. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's an interesting division of what happened. So we don't know, like, I mean, even though the numbers went up, uh, what the linear, I mean, what the uh, final numbers will be, because we saw, like I, I, you know, as we already said, what that meant. But what is important, and I think this needs to be thought more seriously, and not only from the Democratic Republican, but also people that uh, want to change uh, the U.S., um, uh, you know, infrastructures, is to use this opportunity to see what people are interested in terms of like political positions and really mobilize this all along, not wait a few months before the elections, but use this to build up infrastructure locally. And I think that, that the, the Republican Party is much better uh, in local infrastructure than the Democratic Repub uh, the Democrats. And I think uh, politically for us that are more on the critical spectrum, I would like to see this um, uh, becoming an opportunity for building infrastructure uh, like for four years, not wait like the moment of the elections. And that will have an impact in changing or the possibility of uh, having a more of a substantive democracy rather than a democracy run by oligarchs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just to, I, I, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. And um, uh, I think uh, Anna, Anna made a lot of great points. I just want to add a, a couple of last things is that just kind of, kind of concurs that, um, yeah, I mean, the, the turnout was, was very high. Uh, and we saw a lot of voters who um, don't typically vote, come out and vote but they did not break for the Democrats like uh, I think that the Democrats confidently assumed that they would. And I mean, you, you see this in political science and you see this in politics as well. Um, people don't really pay attention to non-voters. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I remember back, I was like, this was when I was like 18 or 19, uh, I, was, I was doing some political canvassing with, a, with, a, with like an incumbent candidate and they, they said something that really <laughs> surprised me. Um, when, they, when they got to someone who said they don't vote, they just said, oh, okay, bye. Uh, and it said, you know, that the, the, the thing about non-voters is they don't vote. Like the, nobody, really, nobody really cares about non-voters in, 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 in politics. And so I, I, I hope that this new turnout, um, especially on, uh, on the Democratic Party side, um, they, they, that they take stock of what happened and why, you know, these, these new groups of voters did not I mean, again, we still have to see what the final numbers are, but it doesn't look like they broke for them, like they thought that they would. Uh, and so I hope that we start looking more seriously at, at these, these non-typical voters and non-voters and start to, to actually make, our, make democracy more inclusive. Um, yeah. Thanks, Adam. Um, I want to stick with the topic of, of democracy under threat, which I think was, was a point that you, you really hammered home in your comments earlier, and, um, and how that affects what happens here in Canada. Um, because as we know, what happens in the US does have uh, an impact here. And um, we, we suffer from a lot of the same um, you know, racism, mistrust, inequalities. So is democracy under threat in Canada as well? Um, I, I'll, 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 I'll start with this one. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that um, in the US, the US has a very unique um, uh, election infrastructure in that like unlike in Canada where you have you know, a centralized um, election agency, Elections Canada, um, that is relatively well insulated from um, uh, partisan politics, basically um, deciding all elections 
And, you know, a, like a voting in a riding in downtown Toronto, the election process is basically the same as if you're voting in, you know, rural Nova Scotia or whatever. Um, that is not the case at all in the United States. Um, the United States, um, the federal elections are left to be run by um, uh, each state. Uh, the top election official in each state is a partisan secretary of state. And, you know, according to this new legal theory that is advancing in, in Republican circles, the states, the, the state legislatures have ultimate authority um, over determining this. And so um, you've seen, um, you know, this, this, this deep history of, um, of uh, you know, racism and, and oligarch politics uh, back from, you know, America's founding, yeah. um, be able to deeply institute itself into um, their uh, electoral mechanisms. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think that just like, like America's like unique and very bizarre <laughs> election infrastructure makes it particularly susceptible to, to, to this. Um, I mean, I, I, I will say um, I, I do, you know, have more confidence in Elections Canada, you know, the provincial elections body than, than any of the American electoral bodies. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we, we always have to remain vigilant. Um, you know, I remember uh, back in 2011, you know, Stephen Harper tried to do a, do a little bit of, of what the Americans are doing in, in, in uh, the Republicans are doing in the U.S. by restricting voter rules, taking away certain ways of voting, that sort of thing. But it, it, it kind of petered out and was mostly reversed by, by the liberals. Um, but uh, so, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the, the severe institutional weaknesses don't quite exist in Canada, but um, the, the type of politics that, that basically maligns democratic outcomes and that, that sort of rhetoric um, and, and ideologies that you see growing in the United States, that can much more easily, you know, come into to Canadian politics. And, and we do see some of it and who knows where it's going to go now. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we have a number of questions waiting in queue, but we, we are running out of time. So I am just going to ask one more. Um, and it's, it's a big one um, before we close. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it to one or both of you, whoever would like to respond. Joan asks, is there no provision in the US Constitution to prevent Trump from steamrolling over everyone and destroying US democracy? Um, can you repeat it? Can you repeat it, please? Because I missed the first part. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Is there no provision in the US Constitution to prevent Trump from steamrolling everyone and destroying US democracy? Okay. Um, I mean, I think this is like an interesting question and it goes back to, you know, what I was trying to say that in, since the 2000s, dramatically, there has been a shift in the way that, um, you know, I, I mean, how power of, of the, you know, of American democracy has been placed in the hands of, let's say, you know, the court. And in a way, I think, and also, I mean, as I said before, in the hands of some of the, you know, the wealthy class. So in this sense, I think constitutionally, and like going back to, like, that's why I began with um, a three-fifths compromise, because in a lot of ways, that is part of the issue. And that's, I mean, this is also linked to how Donald Trump drew extensively in that, and not maybe explicitly in that discourse, when he was talking about the birthism, uh, you know, of um, Obama. So in a way, there is always this kind of mobilization of like um, anxiety about slavery. I mean, I mean, of course, from the South, the, the loss of the slavery institution, which meant a loss to the South. So in that sense, in the Constitution, I would say, I mean, there, has, there have been some, um, um, you know, kind of uh, protections, but they have slowly, slowly been eradicated. And, you know, I actually, um, those protections, I mean, uh, not only eradicated, but we have used other institutions to bolster the ability to eradicate the public's ability to use democracy as an institution to protect their interests. So in that sense, for me, I think this is why contestations around law 
um, and other institutions are really crucial to understand. They are linked, the media, how the media works, who controls it and how so. So I just leave it there. I think it's a very, the power has shifted into the hands of very few. The, the Supreme Court specifically, for me, I think it's a significant um, um, a shift of power and thereby of the, you know, er eradication in some ways of democracy, you know, and cutting through in a democr democratic um, ability in such a way that um, makes even um, uh, the public side things that speak against them, you know, so. Thank you. Yeah, can I just uh, think one quick, I, I, I think, um, yeah, like, like, um, like Anna said, there's there's kind of two 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 sizes, and the one, you know, like yes, we we've been seeing these sort of you know constitutional norms and and protections being challenged, but at the same time, we also remember you know Donald Trump is using the the undemocratic elements of the Constitution to his advantage. He's not he's not just you know going against the Constitution. He's also weaponizing the undemocratic elements of it, such as you know the uh, the, the the way that the Senate seats are allocated, giving hugely disproportionate power to rural conservatives. Um, uh, and you know the, the the federal setup of the courts. Um, you know the the, the Republican Party, um, especially um, you know right wing operatives, um, especially um, you know a lot of that sort of you know that that famous Koch brothers money. Um, you know ha has gone towards you know funding law schools, funding um, uh, legal institutions in order to produce uh, you know a just a, a huge volume. Of highly conservative um, uh, judges, who you know, because of the uh, the, the place of the Senate, are, are now installed throughout uh, throughout uh, the U.S. judiciary. Um, so it's it's both. It's 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 you know, there's concerns about weakening constitutional protections, but also using the Constitution to undermine democracy because the Constitution is not entirely democratic. <laughs> I mean, Julie, I will, I mean, I'll say one last thing, what Adam said, in a way, um, maybe, and to respond to John as well, I think what is important is to realize since there were so many people that went to vote, maybe really working with those people to mobilize the constitutional aspects of democracy to bolster them in a way that really also changes, like Adam was saying, I recognize that some institutions have been weaponized, and I really like that, the notion against the public, the democratic public. So how do we really use some of that, um, you know, uh, let's say passion or, you know, I mean, uh, desire of people to change the institutions to really play a huge role in, in changing and mobilizing some of the constitutional aspects, but also creating spaces to really change some of the discourse that is being circulating, the very fundamentalist discourse that speaks against democracy, basically, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, whatever happens, however this shakes out, it's going to be enormously interesting. And I really want to thank both of you very sincerely for spending this time with us, for sharing your work and helping us better understand this extremely complex situation. There's, there's a lot of layers there. And I, I commend you for, for trying to take on this topic in the short time that we had together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you. Before we, sorry. Before we say goodbye to the audience, thank you also for taking the time to join us today. And oops, sorry about that. I didn't realize I didn't have my video on. Um, as I was saying, before we say goodbye to you, uh, thank you for taking the time with us. Um, we have one last uh, poll question for you that should appear um, in your screen now. Um, we're interested in uh, planning for 2021 and hearing your thoughts and feedback on uh, topics that you would like us to cover next year. So please take a moment to respond to that. Thanks again for participating. And uh, as always, you should feel free to share this talk with your friends. It will be posted on our York Alumni YouTube channel. Um, you can also join our LinkedIn group or follow us on Facebook by searching New York University Alumni. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at York U Alumni. And we're always he interested in hearing from you about uh, topics you're interested in hearing about or any other suggestions or feedback you have for us. You can reach us at alumni at yorku.ca. 
And uh, as you may, may know, if you've been to one of these events before, these Scholars Hub events are held weekly, uh, Wednesdays at noon. However, our regular schedule will pause next week as we observe uh, Remembrance Day. That means our next Scholars Hub will take place on Wednesday, November 18th. Um, and this will be a panel of York Scholars discussing experiential education resources to support students with disabilities. And then the following Wednesday, November 25th, we'll be joined by uh, Je Deborah Pepler, who is a professor of psychology to discuss how relationships are essential to health. Um, and just to correct uh, an email that was sent out to many of you yesterday, Professor Pepler works in the Faculty of Health, not as we stated erroneously, LAPS. Uh, so if you want to learn more about these events or see our lineup through to December, you visit our website, yorku.ca slash alumni and friends and click on events. Thanks again for your time today. I hope you learned as much as I did. And as always, stay safe and be well.